forms of knowledge. Uh, we start with Greg Lindsay, who is a visiting scholar at New York University's Rudin Center for Transportation Policy and Management, where he is part of the Reprogramming Mobility, which is an investigation supported by the Rockefeller Foundation. He's a senior fellow of the World Policy Institute, where he directs the Emergent Cities Project. He's also a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, we need more like him at the Council. I don't know if anybody's a member there. But. A contributing writer for Fast Company, a very witty writer. Most of the time, I haven't read everything, but what I've read is really very witty. And co-author of the international bestseller, Irotropolis, The Way We'll Live Next. Right. Thank you so much, Saskia. Thank, thank you all for coming back and for sticking around. And thank you, Saskia, for having me. This is my third time uh, at one of her conferences. Okay, that's the last one, uh, no, no. See, I love coming back. Um, so thank you all. So, um, and you know, again, to thank, uh, I'm, uh, the title of my talk today is borrowed from our project uh, at NYU. I'm going to talk about some of our investigations. Uh, and so I'd like to thank uh, Mitchell Moss at NYU Rudin and Anthony Townsend, who is our principal investigator, and Rockefeller for funding us. Um, but I'd like to start, being the journalist that I am, I'd like to start with a couple of stories about the sort of notion of, of how mobility is being reprogrammed in sort of the true algorithmic sense. Um, so I have, I have less of an overarching thesis, I think, than some of the other earlier speakers. And Adam, of course, had many, many great points uh, in there, which I, sh which I agree with. Um, but first, I want to tell you a story in particular about, uh, about a conference I was at at Google uh, last month. I moderated a conference there on cities mobility. And the, uh, the keynote there was given by Astro Teller, who is the head of the Google X program, which is also known as their Moonshots program, developing the autonomous cars, their most famous. Um, I'm not sure if Glass came out of that division as well. Um, but this is really their skunk works internally. And so Astro came out and opened his talk with a story at the time they were investigating jetpacks. And apparently they looked seriously into what, you know, what would be the business model, assuming the technology could be perfected. And if we think you know, that cars have a hard physics on them, the physics of jetpacks are even crueler, um, what would be the business model for them? And so Astro realized, you know, that they quickly realized that there was not one, a single business model that was as a tenth as appealing as essentially using it for land development. They were going to, the, the best business model they came up with was is that you would use it to hop on your jetpack across the mountains on the peninsula to the untrammeled wilderness on the other, either side. So you could build your new cabin there that was commutable only by jetpack. This was amazing to me because A, this is exactly the sort of thing that Igor Sikorsky imagined in the 1940s in, in the Atlantic. You know, he imagined that we would have gigantic uh, helicopter buses would carry us uh, into New York and Manhattan from as far as 100 miles away from our pristine cabins. Um, but also the fact that Google literally, the best real estate, or the best, the best uh, business plan they could come up with was taking sprawl to a whole new level. Um, use the jetpack. So they ultimately discarded the jetpack idea, but, but this is exactly what they're talking about with the autonomous car. And this is exactly how Astro discussed the autonomous car they're building at Google. He used the phrase, we are warping space. They're literally using the sort of algorithmic software of the autonomous car and how it interprets space and time cost equations to rewrite cities and rewrite the definition of what is close. And he used the phrase warping space. As a fan of Dune, I wish he'd use the phrase folding space because you know Google really wants to be the navigator's guild of this century. Um, but you know, he, he talked at length about sort of the whole notion that, you know, that, that, that essentially what autonomous cars would do is it would transform the sort of physical armature of the city. I mean, there, there would be no necessity necessarily for, uh, for on-street parking anymore. I mean, what would you do with garages? What would you do with your driveways? Um, they were actually, you know, the, the, the notion, the, the technology of the car itself, whether electric or internal combustion engine wouldn't change, but literally the software, the algorithm, uh, would start, I would say, rewriting space, we could, we could arguably say. And so it was fascinating to me, I mean, the most telling thing about sort of how Astro and Google saw the world is that he actually went off into a tangent discussing the fact that, you know, that while Houseman's Paris is a lovely city, uh, Paris experiences, he called it technological lock-in four or 500 years ago, and that really the city of the future would be the one that would be most inviting to the technologies that we are building today. Um, and so he mentioned here, I just want to make sure I quote him correctly in here, um, you know, uh, if we built cities from scratch today with our best possible vision of the future, we would be as wrong as people were 300 to 400 years ago, years ago were. We have to start thinking about changing cities and building new ones from scratch that don't lock in the technologies that are, but that may be. And I think urban planning has to leave behind a motive of skating to where the puck is and a mode of skating to where the puck will be. Maybe the cities themselves need to move. Maybe we need to build buildings or sections of cities so they can be moved. Finally getting to the place where reconfiguring buildings is happening, we're getting there. And what that modularity is going to look like, I don't know. But we might need to look at self-driving buildings 
as well as self-driving cars. And I just find this fascinating because this is really sort of the you know, notion incarnate of sort of rewriting space that we would actually impose programmability directly onto the built environment. Um, and you know, a couple other, I got this upside down, a couple other uh, quick anecdotes, uh, both about Waze, which one of the earlier speakers mentioned. You know, Waze, of course, is the Israeli software company, crowdsourced uh, uh, navigation and directions app. Um, this is just a representative uh, sample, but I, I put this up there because uh, just a few weeks ago, a pair of Israeli uh, uh, college students revealed that they had hacked Waze. They'd created an artificial traffic jam. Uh, and they did this by essentially, they, they first they cloned a bunch of Way, uh, Waze accounts, uh, and then they basically wrote several apps that could basically spoof GPS coordinates. And so they were able to hack into the Waze system and essentially create a traffic jam uh, in the middle of their own neighborhood. Um, and so Waze interpreted such and was rerouting traffic around it. And to me, this is interesting, A, because it answers Saskia's earlier question, of which is, well, you know, how do you not get the system to keep causing congestion? Well, the inspiration for this hack started when this, one of the students was talking to his professor. They were in a traffic jam, and they realized that if they simply told the system, hey, there's a traffic jam on the coastal highway, it would route everyone off the coastal highway, and they could just drive perfectly right up the coast. <laughs> so this, to me, is interesting. Where Again, they were, the, the, the notion of, again, reprogramming space and reprogramming the environment. They had, you know, there was, Waze has more ability to actually impact transportation through cities than, than arguably transportation planners. And there's a second story about Waze, this one possibly apocryphal, that was told uh, by an uh, engineer at Intel uh, to Anthony Townsend, my, uh, my colleague at NYU, which is the notion that in, at sometime in August 2011, there was a st windstorm in Northern Virginia that knocked over a tree on power lines, uh, which happened to be connected to a major Amazon Web Services data center, which then went offline for several hours. And because this happened in the early morning, this was during the peak Israeli morning commute, and so Waze went offline at the most critical moment of the day. And basically, Israel went into gridlock. Um, and so this, this is particularly interesting because, you know, especially for Israel, where this could arguably could be considered a national security concern, uh, completely inadvertently, Waze had introduced a single point of failure into the entire system where a tree knocking down a power line could put a country thousands of miles away into gridlock uh, at a most pivotal moment. Um, and so I, I use these stories as an example where you know, the, the agency and, uh, and the way the systems are being architected is that you know, we are imposing more and more power uh, onto the built environment by handfuls of algorithms, um, which I think is you know, leading to consequences in mobility that we, that we barely uh, understand. And so at NYU, the, you know, the project that we're working on, reprogramming mobility, um, is sort of taking issue with the fact that the transportation planning complex is not really coming to grasp with this. Um, you know, when you hear a lot of uh, sort of the conventional discussions around, you know, taking technology into, into, uh, into, a, you know, into accommodation, um, you hear a lot of stuff about, you know, intelligent transportation systems, ITS, which I think has been mentioned a few times today. Um, but, you know, traditionally those look at this sort of thing in a sort of straight line manner, right? I mean, most ITS is really sort of grappling with, you know, automated tolling lanes, as an example up here, and sort of, uh, you know, sort of other sort of things, just simply notion of, of expanding throughput through the existing system. Um, but they're not really thinking about sort of the, the, the warping of space, the reconfiguration of space, um, and value and land value in particular that's going to happen uh, as algorithms and you know, programmers and software companies sort of impose their will in the built environment. Um, so, you know, other examples of this. I think it's fascinating, for example, that Lyft and Uber, two startups that now have a combined market capitalization of around $5 billion, that have both raised a half million dollars in the last year, I mean, you know, what actual assets do they have? They, they don't. I mean, this is, Lyft, of course, is a sort of sharing economy model. Um, you know, uh, Uber and UberX, is, uh, UberX in particular, is trying to do something similar with, you know, getting to have peer-to-peer -peer, uh, ride sharing. Um, but, you know, Lyft just raised $250 million last week, which gives it a valuation of about $1.5 billion. Um, and the question I have is, considering they have no physical assets, no drivers, no nothing, and neither does Uber, uh, what are they spending that $250 million on? And the answer is they just hired the former head of data analytics for Netflix, the people who are famous, of course, for their recommendation algorithms. And they're spending it on bulking up their data science center. Um, you know, it's fascinating to me that you know, the two of the most highly valued urban transportation companies out there um, are nothing but software companies, or nothing but building algorithms. Um, another example of this, one that I just wrote about uh, in January for Atlantic Cities, uh, is Project 100 in Las Vegas. Um, uh, Project 100 is part of the sort of Tony Shea Zappos land that's being built there. You know, if you're unfamiliar with this, this is the downtown project, $350 million that Tony Shea is spending to build a creative class company town in the middle of downtown Vegas to attract in entrepreneurs, programmers, uh, you know, people that work at Zappos, et cetera. Um, you know, much of that's being spent in urban amenities like school, charter schools, uh, health clinics, real estate, whatever else. 
Um, but one of the companies they've spawned uh, that he's invested in is called Project 100, that's the code name, um, where they're basically building a multimodal uh, uh, commuting car sharing company. It's car sharing, ride sharing, bike sharing, uh, shuttle bus ultimately, and the notion is, is that you basically pay for you know, mobility as a service. It's a membership model, um, maybe three tiers pricing, but at the high end you pay 500 bucks a month and you could use the service all you want. Um, and so, you know, part of it, their, their big attention getting move was to basically order 100 Tesla S's as their sort of Uber compartment of the, of the service. Um, they're all refundable, so we'll see how many they end up buying. Um, but to me, it was interesting when I went there to speak with them. It's a company of 11 people, you know, and, and they're not, you know, the, um, the, 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 the key to the entire company, which has not yet been written, is going to be the app uh, that members have on there, which, you know, you basically sign in, of course, and you tell the service where you want to go. Um, and then, of course, the service maps your route to the nearest station, whether it, ca it calculates, you know, should you take a bike, should you wait to be picked up, maybe you should hop in a car, you know, a zip car-ish uh, ride here, or, or, or figure out exactly your path and your correct mode. Um, and what I find interesting about it is, is that, you know, they're going to use this app as a way not only to, to be your interface to the system, but to solve the various issues that have, uh, that have bedeviled bike sharing schemes like Barcelona's, London's, and New York's, which is the classic rebalancing problem, right? Um, you know, Barcelona is losing 17 million euros a year because they have to basically physically move bikes around to reset the system every morning. And those of us here from New York, I'm sure you've seen those vans. I know I've seen them in Dumbo every morning on my way to the office where they're dumping bikes off in my, in my particular spot. So they plan to solve this by using an app to basically uh, do what's called in the industry as demand shaping. Uh, so they're basically going to, you know, not feed you necessarily the best single path to get to where you're going, but the one that can accommodate at any given moment profitably. Because this is, of course, a for-profit service. Um, and so it's interesting, they, at the time when I visited them in January, they were weighing in by, you know, with a couple of potential vendors uh, of who would build it for them, or who they'd partner with. Um, one of which was McLaren, which is of course famous for their Formula One racing team, uh, their telemetry data, which has been uh, rolled into uh, uh, various smart city startups like Living Planet um, and others. Um, but you know, and then the other one was a company called Bold IQ, which as it turns out I'd written about seven or eight years ago. Bold IQ was, uh, the, is the remnants of a startup that was called Dayjet, which basically wrote, at the time, it was an incredibly unprecedentedly sophisticated uh, uh, simulator and optimizer for handling private jets, air taxis. Um, and so this is the sort of technology they were trying to work into, which again, you know, it would basically figure out how you sort the whole demand through the system. And then in the end, they decided they were going to write their own, to which I wish them good luck, considering the, the millions of man hours that went into Bold IQ's technology. Um, you know, and then there's particular other interesting ways of sort of how software is going to rewrite this. So this is the second time you've seen the digital Matatu map uh, in Nairobi. Adam had it earlier. Um, this is interesting. I don't know if Jackie's here, but I had I had met with Jackie Klopp, uh, who's one of the instigators of this, uh, who's here at Columbia in the Center for Urban Sustainable Progress, or Center for Sustainable Urban Progress, I can't remember at the moment, um, along with Sarah Williams, who's now at MIT, who did the visualizations of this. Um, and what's interesting, what Jackie was telling me was, you know, this is, this is interesting because the fact that software could intervene, the fact that they could, you know, they could map this, uh, allowed them to create an interesting new multi-stakeholder network that hadn't really existed in Nairobi's transportation planning circles. Essentially, the group that created this was a pair of Columbia academics, a sort of outside creative agency that was active in Nairobi, um, who then partnered with a pair of professors at the University of Nairobi, who then used their students, equipped with smartphones and GPS units, to actually map out all the Matatu routes. And that's, you know, that's been done in several places. There's a burgeoning sort of, you know, uh, uh, informal transit mapping uh, crowd out there. But what I thought was really interesting, Jackie told me, is that, you know, now that they have this, not only are people building apps like Not Navi on it uh, and others to help actual riders figure out which routes and, and how the system is working, but also it's being incorporated into transit planning at the government, government ministries. And also, this is to me the most interesting part, is that, you know, Jackie was saying that their various allies at, you know, one of the largest think tanks uh, in Kenya and elsewhere um, were being placed into positions of power. They had seized an interesting position of power uh, as outsiders because they were able to map this. And I, I like to think of this sort of as a, you know, as a sort of hopeful anecdote um, about, you know, what you can do once you bring sort of software to bear on this. Maybe, maybe it's just one light, point of light in the darkness, but we'll see. Um, to me, this is, you know, this is sort of the interesting flip side of this. What I'm ultimately, ultimately interested in is, you know, we're, we're discussing, of course, the notion of mobility, right? And, and there's a general trend to talk about the transportation side of it. I know Eric brought up earlier that there's, of course, the whole notion of accessibility, right? That mobility is not just traveling to where you want to go, but, uh, you know, sort of the services available to you and intensifying the services available to you. Um, and so I'm also particularly interested in sort of where we're going with the notion of, you know, we could call it city as a service, out of one's wrote about it, space as a service. But the notion of, you know, that we can change mobility by intensifying the uses of the city around us. And this is, of course, you know, sort of a common trope in the, 
you know, in the sharing economy scheme. This is a, I borrowed this from Smithsonian Magazine, which imagined how, how an augmented reality view of the city might look, particularly if we start, you know, and we continue down the path of unlocking um, all these sort of buried assets uh, around us and making it visual. Um, particularly, I'm particularly interested in, in sort of the notions of space. What happens when every, uh, you know, underutilized office is now available for you to use on platforms like Liquid Space or something else like that? Um, and you're able to basically sort of collapse space. What if you can rewrite the city and rewrite space because you're able to utilize more of it, therefore decreasing your need to travel? Um, and so, you know, this is sort of interesting because we're always seeing trends like this, right? We're already seeing, I was reading, there's, there's peak shopping has already happened. The number of shopping trips have already dropped by a third. This is partly because, of course, of Amazon and other delivery services, but the notion of having to take your car and travel to the grocery store is falling. Um, and, you know, there's whole notions about sort of, you know, what's, ever, what's, what's potentially going to happen um, as we see the disaggregation of the office, right? You know, the traditional office, at least for white collar work, um, has something like 30% utilization rates, as, as uh, Frank Duffy famously found. Um, and so, you know, we're training towards models, right, where you now work across a series of spaces, whether it's your home or whether it's your third place and everything else. And so the notion of classic commuting patterns are being rewritten by our ability to find spaces closer to us and use these spaces. Um, and so, you know, this isn't going to be just sort of a straight line effect. So, you know, it remains to be seen you know, what's going to happen, uh, you know, is sort of this thing that becomes, leads to emergent behaviors. Um, there's a great post, uh, that, you know, that went around sort of like whatever happened to traffic. It was written in 2030 and sort of imagine a backward look, which imagine that as work schedules became more and more flexible, you know, imagine we shift to a four day a work week where you work from home for four hours on the, four, on the fifth day. Um, and particularly, you know, considering what we have with unemployment rates and contingency worker rates. Um, et cetera, you know, we could imagine start seeing a collapse in traditional commuting patterns and, and different types of mobility, um, which would then lead us away from sort of the classic car-oriented model. Um, so I'm particularly interested in like this. What happens, you know, when essentially, you know, you can actually uh, uh, intensify your uses because you have more visibility into it. And, you know, one formulation I've seen of this uh, is the notion that in the future, everything will be a coffee shop, which is the notion that in the future, all you really need uh, is the cloud and you need to be around people. And, you know, again, you can see this in sort of retail circles where we're seeing, you know, this, this addition of sociability and, you know, particularly food and coffee um, into places like, you know, the Club Monaco flagship uh, on Fifth Avenue has done this. They added a cafe to a clothing store for no, no real reason. Um, or you look at State Farm in Chicago where they created Nextdoor, which is essentially a coffee shop and co-working space where you might occasionally get financial advice. Um, so, you know, I'd like to think that we're going to see the sort of increasing diversity and intensity of uses, which is, again, its own sort of form of mobility, right? Especially if the cell phone, that device in our hand, is allowing us to sort of use, we can use it as a dowsing rod to unlock all of these things. And, you know, and these sorts of things are already happening. I don't want to imply that this is a digital phenomenon, because we're already seeing really interesting uh, 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 services like 3Space in London, uh, which is basically acquires, uh, uh, acquires buildings that are they acquire some buildings, not necessarily all sort of in foreclosure necessarily, um, and then makes it available to artists and artisans for their own use at sort of micro scale. And, and this, the more famous one, is Renew Newcastle, which uh, an arts organizer named uh, Marcus Westbury started in 2008, where in this case they were buildings in downtown Newcastle, Sydney, that were essentially uh, frozen storefronts because the owners didn't feel like actually signing leases on a short-term basis with people who weren't, you know, high street chains. Um, and so Westbury used something like, you know, basically arts permitting as a way to go in and create the sort of middle ground, the sort of space where uh, you could use things on very short-term leases uh, rather than having to like lock in massive financial commitments. And today it has over, you know, over 100 different artists sharing that space. Um, this is the sort of thing that I'm hopeful that, you know, that this is exactly the sort of new mobility, right? That we can basically become more mobile to these inactive spaces around us. And so, uh, you know, the, uh, the one form of this, or taking to this extreme of that version, is Hitoshi Abe's Mega House from 1997, which Adam used in the space as a service. And Hitoshi is actually starting to pick up some of these ideas again. He's doing a studio at Daiwa House, which is Japan's largest home builder. Uh, to investigate these notions of what if, what, if, what if your house was spread across the city as a membership? What if you had city, true city as a service? And so Hitoshi imagined you know, a sort of closed network where you, know, you could basically uh, go within various skyscrapers. There would be a red door and you would push it or you'd retina scan it and suddenly you'd walk in and there would be your living room for the day kind of thing like that. Um, it's an interesting conceptual vision, but the, the flaw of it is, and, and you know, uh, is that you know, once again, Mega House is conceived as a private service. It's very much like Project 100. Um, and, you know, my biggest fear of all of this, and was, we were getting into this philosophical debate at lunch, is that, you know, is that mobility as a service and city as a service uh, is already sort of being co-opted in traditional models, right? I mean, it's really sad that Airbnb is or is, would be the platform to do city as a service on, and Airbnb has already announced its intention uh, to basically be Hyatt when it grows up, or, you know, to be the Intercontinental Hotel Group. They want 
be a holding company. They want to have a valuation and no assets. Um, and, you know, and of course, Uber wants to be the logistical mesh for cities, the only mobility as a service company you ever need. Um, so I'd just like to say briefly in closing, I mean, you know, to me, what's needed in this, or I think what's needed in this is, is we need to have some sort of available public goods. We need cities, you know, to basically create their own versions of this where you can access space and you can use it uh, more as citizens and as, you know, consumers of a service that's going to take 10% cut off the top forever. Um, as we were discussing, you know, you have various degrees of hope about this. But, you know, my larger point is, you know, that the agency belongs to the people who are able to rewrite space in these various configurations. Um, to me, the thing that I always kept thinking, just to bring it back to Astro Teller, um, is that, you know, I was in a room full of dedicated urbanists, incredibly smart people that I respect a ton, and I could feel the adrenaline coursing through the room. I, you know, the fight or flight uh, reflexes were kicking in, and I couldn't tell if people were going to strangle him or try to run as far as they could. Um, and I kept thinking to myself, this man has $57 billion in cash to realize his vision. Um, so with that, I'll leave it there when we go from questions. But nice, hopeful note. I hope you hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Any questions? John. John. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm, I, I, uh, I like this uh, concept of the, the coppice that you uh, were yes. describing. <laughs> um, but uh, actually, the coppice uh, is a problem for mobilities because, of course, it, what it does is to fragment uh, the, the workplace into lots of different kinds of places and in which people and their, uh, their friends and family members and household members have then probably much more complicated mobility patterns than was the case when most people lived in one place and worked in another. It kind of transforms that. So this sort of you know, flexible working and flexible living is, can be very bad news for mobility patterns. That is very true. I mean, um, that is a good point. I mean, yes, there is, there is a company. Are you sort of meaning that uh, we'll basically have a spiraling out of control trip chaining kind of thing like that? We've seen multiple things in that. Um, that's quite possibly true. I mean, I, you know, from a pure sustainability standpoint, you know, I haven't taken that fully into consideration on imagining what the consequences of that be. Um, I always think of, you know, the notion of that this is a very old mobility pattern too. This is sort of, you know, Frank Duffy once pointed out that Samuel Pepys was the first mobile worker, you know, where he had an office next, he had an office next to his house but not in his house, and then of course was working at the docks or working at court um, and those sorts of things. I mean, I don't think I don't think it obviates the need for exactly the kind of mobility systems that you included there, but it does. It just to me, it's interesting because it raises different patterns beyond, uh, you know, the sort of the scale at which we're operating right now. I mean, it's the sort of thing where you know there is in any given neighborhood an intense city like New York, you know, amounts of vastly underutilized space, and and, all, and I'm also particularly interested in the notion of you know what it means for something like the future of work. That's one of the angles I come at it. Where today, you know, you work in a, you work with the same people you get a paycheck from versus the people you should be working with. So I like to think it would create something more, more flexible groups of people you can learn from, hopefully more closely in your community. But yes, you're right. There's absolutely, absolutely nothing keeping it from becoming an even more massive uh, uh, explosion in further, further mobility. Oh, hi. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm the only one who's uncomfortable uh, with the presentation. It was fantastic work. But I feel it does it not factor anything about inequality. Any of the examples you gave, Uber, Airbnb, are things that completely design out the most unequal people. And in this hall, I do not see a single person of color. So I don't even know if we're including them in the conversation. Why are they not part of this conversation? And are we designing a future where we're basically designing out poor people or people who can't afford to be part of Airbnb and Uber class? Oh, yes, absolutely. This is exactly how they're seeing it. Um, no, I, I agree with you completely on this. I mean, Yes, the, I, I don't. We, we could explicate this out all day, but th this is this is why I, you know, this is why I put in digital matatus too is a more interesting notion of this. But yes, Uber and Lyft and, and that whole class of, of sharing company, sharing economy companies coming out of, the, of, of Silicon Valley, are, this is to me it's an interesting point. They are taking the economic model and economic logics of the informal economy in cities in the global south, uh, and you know where everything you own is an asset, everything is tradable. 
uh, this sort of intense entrepreneurialism, which has a metabolism that is ultimately unsustainable and unhealthy, and then applying it uh, into a developed economy where basically we can argue because of the economics of austerity, we're all now living the same way. And you know, and of course, you know, Uber is not particularly interested in anyone who can't pay Uber's prices. So, so yes, no, I, I, I would agree. We are engineering inequality into the equation if you follow that through, which goes back to my, my final point there, which is in passing, which is you know, we need to see, you know, and I, it's, we need to see actual public bodies, we need to see, pub, we need to see these things invested as public goods. And you know, it's, it's very quickly to start from disturbed and then slide into despair about whether we'll actually see this done. This is why you know, I take some slight hope from places like Tallinn and other societies where you might actually see investment in these systems as public goods. Otherwise, yes, otherwise it's Uber taking 10% off the top of everything forever. Yeah, I think that that is indeed a very serious logic. And there's another, I'm just looking at one particular angle, which is the buying, international buying of urban land you know, which is camouflaged as buying buildings, houses, you know, because that's how you buy urban land. But this is something that is spreading, and this is the beginning of a trajectory. This is not simply about having that land sitting there, you know, for collateral, no. This is the beginning of a trajectory. And so coming back to the comment that also you launched this morning, space, urban space as, as service, or, or I can't remember exactly the phrase that you used, or maybe you said it. You know, and then the question is, servicing what? Because till now we have taken for granted that public urban space, i.e. streets, and are servicing communities, larger projects, non-monetized issues, right? But we have more and more private streets, like, you know, Potsdamer Platz, rebuilt. Well, all the streets are privately owned on term, not forever, but they're privately owned streets. They just don't look like that, but when they want, they can, you know, uh, right. So, so there, is a, there is a lot hanging in this, and I know that Greg has a critical perspective on all of this. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry to then come across further. I certainly don't endorse that. I, the, two, the two things I, I was thinking of just came no, out of this. Because you do sound sometimes like, you, this is great. The, the enthusiasm with which you tell it. Yes, no. And one must stand I'll, back I'll, I'll and work, say... I'll work on my darker mutterings <laughs> about it next time. But no, one, one thing I want to say about, about, about the urban space you have in there, one thing, one thing that came out of Astro's talk that he mentioned too is what, I mean, almost the way Google's seeing it when they see it as a real estate problem is not, uh, they don't see it as almost, um, they don't see it as colonizing existing space. To them, it's a question of it, because we can use algorithms and we can change the equations, we can literally summon into existence new space that did not exist before by changing, you know, by sending autonomous cars to pick you up at the, at the hardened metro stop and carry you to a cafe. So for example, one of the examples that came up was the notion of, you know, the, the, the businesses that have huge, uh, huge catchment areas because they are next to transit stops. Well, you know, Google's imagining what happened if you had autonomous cars that would pick you up and carry you a half mile down. What if you could increase catchment areas using autonomous cars? This starts changing the value of a business, this starts changing land values. This is the sort of thing that they found exciting, is that they, because of a, an algorithmic intervention into it, which they would own all the data on, they would start changing how space was perceived. And this is interesting, because yes, this is, this is a sort of intensification of land value and, and value but, capture as well. But you know, there are also software that could be developed for artists. Like I remember my son, who is an artist, first arrives in London, poor, no money. Actually, he had money because he had sold something, but still. And so they, they got together with a bunch of artists, and he had his first show in London, in a squatted building in a very good area because it was gentrification and the law in, in London is after the police comes and tells you you're illegally occupying this space, you get three months. My God, that, that's all that's they amazing. need. Three months. And the show was reviewed, you know, publicly. And I love that juxtaposition. We should develop software, you know, that mixes the law. What is the law about occupying space? And then, you know, in other words, the, the capability of that algorithm yeah. uh, you know, it, it's a variable. You can use it to abuse, and you can use it maybe to do some good, interesting things. Right. Question, you have yes. Hi, I'm very good uh, presentation. I'm curious about uh, the program in Las Vegas. Yeah. And it sounded like um, they're intending to, in, uh, to kind of direct the demand in order to optimize the systems. And our research and analysis at Mobility Lab in, in, uh, makes us think that you know humans are a little more tricky than that. That you know we have our preferences, and and to tell someone you must take a car versus a bike, you must take a bike versus walking, or whatever. You know people are apt to not necessarily go the way you want to want them to. So curious how you think that will turn out. 
Oh, for them, I mean, I, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, uh, they're they're the first to admit that they don't really. Uh, you know, know how, how it'll start. I mean, to them, to them, it's a, it's a suggestion. And they're also, you know, they're dealing with sort of soft incentives as well, too. You know, the notion, I think, it was confusing how they, because they were still figuring out their pricing models. But, you know, the notion of, like, we'd give you, if you were in the lower service tiers, we'd give you credits if you took the shuttle bus rather than asking for the Tesla, you know, which they assume everyone will want, you know. If you have a Tesla S to drive around, you know, everyone's going to ask for the Tesla. Um, so, yeah, they, they expect it not to be a, a hard cap, as in you can only take this right now, or maybe they will and say this is all that's available. Um, but, you know, I think they would imagine it would alienate their users. Um, so they're going to use it as a sort of a soft mechanism to try to first guide them there and, you know, and hopefully not lose, lose their shirts. But that was, it was sort of interesting. I, one thing I sort of uh, garble in there is, again, that's sort of, uh, it's an interesting experiment because, yeah, the notion of intensifying the use of downtown Las Vegas, of course, again, becomes a land value operation, particularly when Tony Shea is buying up all the land or buying up large chunks of land. Um, so this is, again, seen as sort of an augmentation of, of sort of, you know, of the, of the land value. And, um, you know, and then they're also debating, you know, figuring out, uh, and I think this is interesting for, for car sharing uh, and ride sharing and all this stuff, which I should point out, the Germans have been doing for 20 years. Bremen's mobile punk is like 20 years old and Berlin's doing this too, is the notion of, you know, how do you extend car sharing, ride sharing into the suburbs? How do you push it beyond sort of dense urban environments? And, you know, they're willing, they're, they're trying to do that themselves. It'll be interesting. Um, you know, I just find it fascinating that, you know, that um, they're perceived in the press, and, and I've written about this too, as a sort of really innovative U.S. experiment, which, you know, which in other countries like Germany that have, you know, actual public goods and this sort of thing have been doing it for decades, and it's old hat. Any other questions? All right, great, great, great. Thank you. Our next speaker is Claire Robert, who is a researcher in the Urbanizing Technology Project. She's based in, um, in Montreal. She has been a researcher for, on, on a whole variety of subjects that link to digital technology. Her original research interests were in the transnational network practices, specifically of actors from a diversity of countries and cultures. This case study led to a theorization of the passage looking at 19th century technological advancements as part of new architectural developments in the city and to furthering the analysis to include contemporary digitized networks. In other words, using a very long temporal frame that breaks with the idea that, okay, this is when digital technology emerges, so that's when it all starts, <laughs> and bringing in an earlier period. Um, she has been an outreach specialist of a hub of research on issues and controversies in media, technology and culture based at McGill University and supported by the Canadian Beaverbrook Foundation. Claire. Thank you, Saskia, for inviting me. Thank you to everyone for being here. Um, there seems to be an hermeneutics uh, crisis. Oh, please change the glasses. <laughs> otherwise, it's going to be a long talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, otherwise, it's going to be a long talk. There seems to be an hermeneutics, hermeneutics crisis. This is the case in part because theorists have not learned to code, and also in part because the object of study are simply not available. This is what Gert Loving wrote just recently, and Mackenzie's work answered him two days ago. It was, and probably still is, useful to know something about code, but there are other technical and even scientific knowledges it may help to at least know a little about. So I'm proposing to reflect on those interactions of knowledges about a visible technical object and also its invisible uh, uh, aspect. Mobi mobilities have been multiplying, often closely imbricated. Other mobilities may appear independent. Nevertheless, all mobilities are either mode or bound to a mode. That defining mode may be invisible on first sight. It is not because a mode is invisible that it will not have at some point, after repetitive di digitization of behavior, a visible societal effect. As Doreen Massé said, it is not that the interrelation between objects occurs in time and, and space, 
It is this relationship themselves which create, define space and time. When Gies presents the passage as a built form with a direct effect on the different building, the passage follows. He moves from using passage to the mode of passage. Those building and what they represent become part of a mode of passage. They become intrinsically involved as well in the new mobility that has become accessible to people. New possibilities are added to the rudimentary architectural passage as the exit and entrances multiply. To me, the variable element of mobility stands as a mode. Thus, I'll be speaking of modes of mobility. Mode of mobility, what is created around the mobility about the mobility. The term mode of mobility carries many dimensions. It nuances mobility. It also distinguishes the participatory aspect, a central action inherent to sociality. And it also helps answer one of Saskia's questions, how to use this type of knowledge about invisible mobilities to expand the notion of mobility. Much of the dis dis digital mobility is not visible. So this is a view from the Williamsburg Bridge looking west showing congested traffic in Manhattan in 1923. It's a timeline from the precious, previous image that we, we just saw. We see the bu busy, unorganized streets in the city. Most of the mobility is visible and limiting spaces. Already in 19th century, technological advancement are part of new architectural development. Engineers and architects vision, multiply, projects, diversify, all tend towards a radical technicization of the cities, expanding the existing structure to include other spaces or to link spaces, to create new communicational passages, and with it, many modes of mobility emerge. Ways to circulate, such as the subway, later on the express, the tunnel, carry their own modes of mo passage and mobility, each relating to their own assemblage, defining by their own constitutive elements, all part of progress, all performing in new transitory spaces. And as a result, modes of mobility are constructed based on specific structural changes, creating new needs as well. Those are visible mobilities, visible mobilities which affect sociality as well, creating new habits in repeated forms. Those repeated behaviors may well include as well invisible digitization, which, while the repetitive behaviors continues, participate in formatting those behaviors. Technological advancement often carries an anonymous condition, and thus its mode of mobility is not visible or predictable. This said, user practices also play a role in creative narrative spaces sometimes unplanned by the invisible or the visible components of the uh, original device. Here are a few examples of practices which authors use digitization to attain a specific goal. This is Eckelman's train line in Philadelphia. The, represent the representation Eckelman's creates of the train line in Philadelphia uh, it's a right on top of the real underground train line. Below this work of hers is actually the subway lines. It actually calls for attention, and her goal is really to show the invisible to the eye subway once you're not, you know, taking the subway. It's really to make you aware, make the inhabitants aware while they're walking into the city what is happening underground. <laughs> Uh, Eckelman wants you to imagine the reality of the digitized underground transportation in your urban life, even though you are walking about, above the line, on the surface, on its envelope, if I can say. She wishes you to understand how that structural part of the city is made of. In this case, that is a specific mode of mobility that you need to understand is part of your surrounding. That awareness she creates of the underground is a part of her own artistic vision, However, it is also a political move as she makes the subway visible, while previously, from that perspective above, it was not. This new movement includes the inhabitant of the city. Thus, for the passive user of the subway to the spectator of the artwork, she provoked a personal reflection about the subway, where and how its mobility interacts with the surrounding in urban life. In, in my opinion, Ackerman loves to hack cities in her own personal way, 
not against the system, you know, uh, but towards an opening of one's perception of uh, occupied spaces. This is, again, Ekelsmann's work, which is called Network, Net Space Work. Uh, her public artwork shows an inherent desire to address sociality on a scale visible and physically inevitable to humans. It feeds from her personal understanding of life's journey and significance. She's not looking for the occasion, as De Certo would put it. Rather, she sets her work in cities and brings out memories of historical space to externalize the modulation of the locality. In this case, um, it's the shape of a net because those cities are near uh, the water and there were uh, older uh, fishing uh, place. So she brings this up using that representation of the net. Um, to succeed in carrying her vision, she says that she had to learn a lot of digitization and she really had to learn about computer work, which she didn't know beforehand. And, but that did not let her uh, discouraged. She said she really had to attack the understanding of all the nuances, both the computerization of her artwork, because it moves actually, um, and the mechanical aspect of her artwork. Okay. Um, Today's digitization carries, too, a sense towards expanded, added, extended, communicative way. Not so much about reproduction, per se, uh, but more about direct connectedness. In mathematics, connectedness signifies all in one piece. When a mathematical object possesses that quality, it is connected. Today's connectedness is about not being disconnected. In that mode of mobility, all the components are connected. To connect is to start the engine according to the digital, digitized settings. Molecular paths are set up to connect spaces. Graph theorization is about connectivity. The connectivity of a graph is the minimum number of vertices that has to be removed so to disconnect the graph. The graph then becomes disconnected. However, connectedness imposes a continuous path between any two points. In addition, Connectedness in human development can signify being part of a collective unconscious, being part of a larger picture. Both realms of connectedness imply certain responsibilities. Awareness of these responsibilities creates a value system. Human connectedness is now revealed in digitization, so all is set in advance. This is why, on that artificial level, digitization development today is all about the given connectedness technology embodies. On another hand, connectedness is for others a solution towards more human awareness as a result of a better understanding of the technology. Um, this is not a digital artwork, but Campbell, in his own way, um, is one person who likes to poke people. He asks the city following his own artistic journey. He's not using digital device as Eckelman does or others, but after six years, he calls this the archive of his traffic cones. Campbell is a Montreal artist inviting inhabitants to take a cone he made out of paper and then to set it anywhere in the city. They felt something was not right and should be fixed. If a mirror clear, clearly as the medium is paper, however, the awareness is present. Some element of the city, which are at first glance part of the regular walk one may have going to work and therefore almost invisible, although a materiality, all of a sudden become visible because a co they're coned. Like if, you know, like if all of us, the inhabitant want the other to see the problem and then share that problem with them. So the cone creates a visible space for a problem that possibly was not seen or pushed up front when only walking by and not notice, noticing. Um, this is a typical, we know them, they are invisible, we see them but we don't see them but those are the inhabitants and they are invisible. 
hidden often. However, they do act and act and hack, and sometimes coming out of the internet space for demonstration. But not that often, most likely, they stay invisible. But while the invisible, they attack the invisible, their attack become visible. So those practitioners, including those hackers, have their bias and their modes of mobility and purposes of inser insertion, insertion of the technolo technological objects. As demonstration demonstrated at the end of the video, anonymous European mega raid in Dublin, I don't have the video, but at the end it says, when the tech fails, there is always the fingers. This is a nano art, it's an art project produced by PaperCop in collaboration with the physics department at the Politecnico di Torino in Italy. But they are not, they are not the only one, the hackers, who use invisible coding of some sort to express their thoughts or expression. Nano art has been a very interesting medium to better understand what one could do in using the technology, the molecular aspect of nano content. I quote both um, Alexandre Scali and Robin Good who worked together on the project. Nano art is a new frontier, a new boundary, a new media by which we can create and communicate. We have searched to create an aesthetic paradox, a piece of art that you can never see yet that exists and carries a message. The objective through integrating art and nanotechnology is to realize artworks in micrometers and nanometers. As we know, micrometers being a thousandth of a millimeter, millimeters and around the size of microorganism and cell, and cell, sorry. A nanometer being 0 0.00001 millimeters and a thousand thousand times smaller than the smallest human cell. So we, they do this work with micro, special nano microscope, and you can only see the artwork using the same tool. This is one of the artwork, artwork that they blow up, obviously. It's called Beyond Air Curls Columns, and again, it's in collaboration with the Politecnico di Torino, the physics department in Italy. Uh, looking at invisibility, knowing about it, and learning about it. That's a bit why I'm showing those artworks, because it's one way to understand what's happening with the invisible. Um, that's a mixed media uh, work. The effect is visible to the eyes. This is not nano. It's used some of the nano uh, materiality. However, you could see it as we see it today. The black lines that you see, they are ferrofluid. It's a mixture of all and nanoscale iron particles that respond to a magnetic field. These fluids are normally used to seal computer hard drives or as a contrast medium in, media, in uh, medical imaging. This was created by Fabian Hofner, who often used scientific phenomena to create images. So what he does, he plays a few drops of uh, ferrofluid on a white, um, plate of glass and position a round magnet under, underneath it to create a circle, as you wish, and forms uh, those shapes and then um, adds um, watercolor to it. It does disrupt the magnetic link between the iron particles. So it's pushing the invisible to the surface, mixing it with the visible. That's really how I understand this. Okay, this is uh, an implementation by Jing Li of the NASA Ames, and um, do we know what it is? It looks like a cell phone shape, the bottom of a cell phone case. Um, it is a visible object, it's recognizable as such. However, uh, it is uh, invisible parts that are the most uh, interesting. Um, there are 32 nano sensor bars on the one chip about the size of a postage Stamp. Each of these bars is composed of different nanostructural material reacting to different chemicals in different ways and providing real-time monitoring. So, for example, this could read uh, the nitrous oxide in one's breath, which is a strong chemical presence in a cancer patient. And that could indicate that you may need to see your doctor. Thus, in devices and extra elements added to a device, a mode is set, a mode of mobility that might well define a way a way to go, a way you choose to go towards, a way to set your life. 
imbricating with other um, mobilities. Uh, this is a show this image because we often don't show this image since Latour's works on laboratories. Um, I like to show this because emerging works are often created in scientific laboratories. There are new imbrication of mobilities being exercised in those space and learning about science may well add to one's existing knowledge and understanding of modes of mobilities today. Um, this sense of the smallest ship acting in big visible ways adds to reading, readings of uh, invisibility. So back to the city, had we left it? Is it not all a togetherness of mobilities imbricated and differentiating at the same time with, from one another? The mode complexifies the imbrication as they often ask us to see what cannot be seen, sometimes also demanding for one to act socially, culturally, or politically. This is the cover of Frank Lloyd Wright's book, The Living City. I like the drawing of Henry Wolfe on the cover of this book. It represents well the organic feeling of the city that Frank Lloyd Wright was looking forward to. He wrote about the possibility to become mobile outside the city, creating an organic culture rather than a ready-made one by one, one, rather than a ready-made one by the dominant powers. For him, the highways, highways were then becoming the decentralized city. His dream of the perfect home outside the city is not so far away from today's social necessities and mobilities in an urban setting, the city which has been expanding and growing larger and larger. To keep one freedom, he says, the individual is to be able to make choices, to be creative, not to be rented. However, Wright also believed that the motorization of cars made the old city obsolete. Today, the new mobility of the car is now in nuances. It has not made the old city obsolete, even though it definitely has transformed it. Saint Pirac, on the other hand, Look at the complexity that keeps expanding the city, including the freeway, the road, and in between city. It would add that the city is now constructed from the road, where position of social life, such as in the gas station, are constructed only and by the people stopping in. Otherwise, the gas station remains neutral while colonizing the road. Thus, only reconnoit once acknowledged the mobilities of the people and their cars, the um, gas station exists. From now on, said Saint Pirac, the city builds itself from the road. The gas station has transformed the city, and architecture of circulation has been legitimated. Digital technology adds layer of complexity to the already existing networks in the city, parallel corridor, airways, dark fiber, potentially linking people together and to the outside world. Those fragmentation of the different mobilities participate in the city's incomplete and completeness, one cannot tell ahead of time what will be the inputs. Moments. Yes, yes. The computerization of the city, um, numerous network channels locally or centrally coordinated have been multiplying as old cities get bigger and new ones are built. This is to imagine something so small that it's a million times smaller than the length of a land. This is a nano car with turning buckyball wheels. In response to increase in temperature, the nano car moves about on a gold surface as a result of the buckyball wheels turning as in a conventional car. At temperature about 300 Celsius, it moves around too fast for the chemist to keep track of it. This nano car certainly not one that can be visible in the real, in, in our streets, still render possibilities towards reading what is invisible towards visibility. So to conclude, because of the mobilities of people, merchandises, and transportation, the mode of passage transforms its relationship to society, and thus, in this mode of transition, the passage invites new reading of the existing mobilities so I a bid came back to my title because it was different mode, restricted, imposed, ignore, open, and, and hack. And I look at mobilities and what, what was invisible and what was visible. 
And I like to think that they're restricted, and I try not to be political so much in analyzing this. I try to see how one could read it, you know, in many ways. And thinking that the restricted could be hidden and unknown, the, unknown, the impose, uh, the invisi invisibility could be a weapon. The ignore one, um, if there's no effect, even though it's ignored, that's a question. Uh, the added narrativity um, of the opened uh, modes would be who opens it and what becomes available. And again, for the invisible aspect of the hacked modes, um, it provokes the invisible and it opposes it and it makes it visible. So um, I could, I could, am I good with time? Oh, you're a bit over time. But oh, sorry. Everybody has done that, so don't feel bad. Sorry. So that's it. Thank you. Excellent. Are there, are there any questions? She's walking away, but we can bring her back. It, but we are running very late at this point, so uh, if, if are there no, I, I have questions, but I will ask you over, over drinks, Claire. <laughs> I love doing that. Uh, so Walter, wh where are you, Walter Hook here? Walter Hook is our next speaker and final speaker. And uh, I've known Walter for a very long time. Uh, he is today the Chief Executive Officer of the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy that has been one of the most innovative bodies and has now become really a global operation. Global in the sense of multi-sited interventions, very specific interventions. Uh, he's considered one of the foremost exports, experts in bus rapid transit and non-motorized transport planning. Uh, throughout his career, he has worked to make transport more environmentally sustainable and equitable. He has worked in large international financial institutions, no, with, not in, I'm sorry, such as the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and various UN agencies to redirect, and this is important when one mentions all of those institutions, he has worked with them in order to redirect hundreds of millions of dollars in transport funding to more sustainable <laughs> transport projects. So he probably is a rather, uh, I, they probably don't love you in some of those banks. You must have put a lot of pressure on these people. Um, under his leadership, this in, the institute that he, that he leads has transformed from a small advocacy nonprofit. I remember that he was a student here at Columbia, right? Yes. I had something to do with your education or not. Maybe your political education, a small advocacy non-profit to a leading international organization with over 70 staff and offices in every region of the globe. Walter. Thank you, Saskia. Yes, you were on my committee. <laughs> um, let's see, how does this thing work? Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the dissemination of more sustainable modes of transportation. Uh, and it seems to be going in waves, and it seems to be quite standard, and it doesn't seem to vary that much from one country to another. Just as in the latter part of the 19th century and the earlier part of the 20th century, the streetcar sort of spread throughout the globe, uh, and I want to emphasize it was really a global phenomenon. I mean, you had streetcars from Budapest to Buenos Aires to Shanghai to Jakarta uh, to, to U.S. cities, etc., uh, which was then uh, the, the automobile-dominated cities. Similarly, the technology became predominant, and it swept throughout the globe. Uh, uh, although there were little hints of what might come, there was planned exclusive bus lanes in Chicago already in the 1950s, and plans for networks of exclusive bus lanes already uh, uh, tabled in the 50s and 60s as the streetcars uh, disappeared. Uh, but they, they weren't ever implemented, but they're starting to get implemented. Uh, so then you had in the late 70s and the early 1980s the, the development of uh, bus rapid transit in Curitiba, Brazil. It was sort of the invention of Jaime Lerner. Essentially, they took all of the little component parts of what makes a metro give a very high speed of service, and they broke them down into their essentials, and they reassembled them using surface streets and buses, and they were able to achieve the same performance 
that you achieve uh, with a metro system, but at a fraction of the cost. And that changing of the fundamental economics suddenly meant that it was possible to build uh, magnitudes of more mass transit more quickly in poorer countries. And this uh, invention has transformed the globe and it's gradually transforming cities throughout the world. It's sort of the wedge issue. And the political economy behind that that's making that transformation possible is the sort of dying out of the, of the economic power of the automobile industry. It's, it's a heavy manufacturing industry, although a, a, a very modern one, uh, as Saskia's mentioned, the Audi is a very sophisticated piece of technology, but ultimately a car is really just a car. And uh, as you can see, other than in China, <laughs> other than in China, it's a dying industry. Uh, which means that the political power of the automobile industry is, is giving way to uh, other industries that are uh, more interested in great public space and sophisticated employees that have nice cafes and such. So uh, the, 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 the bus rapid transit system invented in Curitiba was, was done one better by uh, uh, Mayor Peñalosa in, in Bogota, Colombia, because uh, that system uh, prove that you could achieve m metro level speeds and capacities using bus based technology. It was something everybody believed you needed a metro if you had more than 12, 13,000 passengers per direction per hour and they managed to move 36,000 passengers per direction per hour in Bogota using bus based technology. And there was a bunch of sophisticated engineers that made this possible. Uh, it became then, the, 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 the introduction of the BRT system became sort of a stint like in a heart, you know. It's, uh, it makes the, the same old streets retrofittable into uh, uh, what we need for the, the modern economy. And it's become for us the political wedge that we use to then transform the entire nature of the street and then the entire nature of the buildings around the street. So cities are sort of reinventing themselves under a modern paradigm around a backbone network of affordable bus rapid transit and it's happening from one place to another. And interestingly about this technology, it's not really being pushed by a corporate lobby exactly. It's being pushed by uh, the fact that the technology is just so vastly superior economically, and it's being pushed almost by a kind of new political movement uh, and a charismatic leader of it. Uh, uh, Peñalosa, the mayor of Bogota himself, is very charismatic and he's traveled around the world with us uh, to promote it to public citizens who've then put pressure on their governments. So it's become like a political movement that's driving the dissemination of this technology. It's not like Volvo is behind it. Uh, they maybe wish they were, but they actually don't have the same kind of power that some other companies do. So what we see is an actual uh, trajectory of expansion of kilometers of bus rapid transit over time that's almost a logarithm in its growth in the last 10 years. And that logarithmic growth happens to correspond with the decline of the political power of the automobile industry. Um, the, uh, as you'll notice, this technology was developed in Latin America and it's disseminated first into Latin America, both in terms of total kilometers and in terms of the quality of those systems. The Latin American engineers know what they're doing and they're doing better jobs and that exportation of that technology to Asia, to Africa, to Europe, to the US and Canada is taking a little bit more time. Uh, now, this is, this is quite interesting. If we, we've developed some metrics for how many kilometers of mass transit there are per urban resident. And you'll notice that the European example of France is just in a whole different universe. Uh, you'll also notice that, uh, that the United States is not doing too bad on a per resident uh, basis. The developing world has a long way to catch up. But what you'll also notice if you take a, a very close look, you'll notice that the expansion in France is largely uh, rail-based. It's metro, it's light rail systems. And the result of that has been that the corporate lobby behind the rail industry is almost entirely French. Uh, the big metro companies, Siemens, uh, Alstom, are both big uh, French government financed uh, uh, industrial companies that are uh, almost very unscrupulously selling these technologies in the developing world, even though they're far more expensive and less effective than bus-based mass transit. But if you look at, what, at, at what's happening 
again, in terms of per kilometer of mass transit per resident, uh, the countries that have adopted bus-based mass transit, like Colombia, have just suddenly uh, catapulted up the amount of mass transit available per resident at a speed uh, that has been unachievable in countries that have invested much more heavily in rail-based technology. Now, the Chinese are really interesting. The Chinese are building metros at a pace that's never been seen historically, and yet when you look at what that's doing per resident, it's not matching the performance that what Bogota has matched and uh, is, has met in terms of meeting those people's basic mobility needs. So the bus rapid transit technology is clearly uh, uh, outperforming the other modes. You can also see that, you know, that the, the rail lobby in Brazil is very, very strong, and so the vast majority of the spending is on rail-based modes, but the kilometers rolling out, bus rapid transit is a, a big share of it. Uh, so what is it? It's, you know, just a few basic elements. It's uh, you pay to enter the bus station rather than when you get on the bus. Uh, you have big, you have an at-level boarding with the bottom of the floor. All of these are just things that you have in metros. It just, they didn't cost that much to implement. And you see this now rolling out. Johannesburg, we were involved in this one. Guangzhou, we were involved in this one. Uh, Ahmedabad, India, we were involved in this one. Uh, Nantes in France, uh, Quito, Las Vegas, Bogota, of course, Cleveland, Mexico City. It's really a pan global phenomenon. Very interestingly, Tehran, Iran has this. So there's clearly not a, a kind of cultural basis. This is a, a tech, Dar es Salaam, this system we were very heavily involved. It's going to open hopefully next year. I mean, it's even in a very, very poor sub-Saharan African country, they have the money to invest in a bus-based mass transit system. This is transforming cities around the world. Uh, and what we found is that if you can actually extract the, the elements and rank them in terms of their importance the way any engineer would, and you can sort of recognize what is best practice and, and give them a standard, and you can say, this is really bus rapid transit, this isn't which then allows us to aggregate uh, those systems and say, well, if you have a gold standard BRT, uh, what imp or you have a gold standard light rail, what impact does it have on land development? So we now have measurable metrics, and we found using you know, these databases we're developing that bus rapid transit has the same uh, impact on land development that rail-based transit uh, investments have, but at a fraction of the cost. Um, so, well, the other thing that's going on with the political economy, of course, is that the automobile uh, used to take 200 hours of man time to produce back in 1960, and today it takes only about 30 hours, so the value of the car over time is going to drop, uh, whereas the, the, the labor involved in bringing you a beer at a sidewalk cafe is about the same as it was in 1960. So, uh, as a result, uh, over time, public parking spaces and service parking lots uh, and available road spaces are being transformed into public spaces, cafes, and, and, and things like this, and the economics, obviously, is, is creating incentives to do that. And this is not only happening in New York City, it's happening in Buenos Aires, it's happening in Tehran. This is a newly pedestrianized street in front of the Grand Bazaar. It's also happening in Guangzhou, which despite the fact that the automobile uh, industry is still extremely powerful in China. Uh, China also has great new pedestrian spaces. They just recently uh, opened up a, a formerly uh, buried uh, uh, Grand Canal in the city center of Guangzhou and uh, re reminding itself of its own history. Uh, and it's become an incredibly popular public space. They've built a thousand kilometers of greenways in China. When China gets the right idea, it does it in a huge way. Uh, um, Paris, of course. Uh, Bogota has created these wonderful public spaces, not only in the city center, but also in the very low-income neighborhoods uh, with a very self-conscious equity interest that, that the poor uh, uh, need public space even more than the rich. Uh, so this is a real uh, thing that uh, Penuloso uh, pushed through. Uh, bike sharing, of course, is going viral. All these shared technologies, I like that uh, presentation of the earlier guy very much. This is absolutely what's happening. Bike sharing is going viral. It's also in Tehran, who knew? 
Uh, Paris, of course, had a huge impact. China is doing bike sharing. The biggest bike sharing systems in the world are in Hangzhou, uh, Wuhan, Rio's trying. Mexico City has maybe the best uh, system. We're also finding that the land, or once you've got the backbone of, of a bus-based mass surface mass transit, it's important it's a surface because you're trying to transform the surface. Uh, it's very visible. It becomes its own political advocacy tool. The public can see it. They can see that their street has been transformed and their ideology is transformed. And you can then come in and create little great little public spaces along it, which we did brought Jan Gell's people in to design little places, uh, which are now full of people. And we found that we could also discern, just from you know, the, uh, the literature, what makes a great public space. And Gell's people, using behavioral psychology, have found that a lot of what makes a great uh, city is discernible into constituent parts. Uh, active street fronts, uh, small walkable blocks, etc. And we pulled all this together and just like we did with the BRT standard, we've created the transit-oriented development standard and we found that China has some gold standard urban development, but most of it is in Europe. And uh, so we scored a bunch of great places and they were very heavily determined it to be in Europe. Now, there's a few in the US, there's a few in Latin America. So will these great urban designs be exported from Europe into uh, the developing world? Uh, or is it too culturally determined, these public spaces? We think it isn't. We think it's like BRT. There's certain behavioral characteristics of humanity that are common that uh, makes these eight or 10 measurable urban characteristics exportable, generalizable. But of course, they will be reinterpreted uh, in the cultures that, that use them. It's essentially a peeling back of the domination of public space uh, uh, by the automobile. Um, what, it, what is different from place to place is the assets and the capacity of the government. Uh, sometimes the governments are very weak. Sometimes the tax base is very weak. Sometimes the corruption is very strong. Sometimes the private uh, transit industry is very uh, disorganized. Sometimes it's largely informal, sometimes it's controlled by criminal gangs. So the transformation of these systems uh, from, uh, the transformation of these systems from uh, whatever pre-existed into a high quality public transit system requires a very sophisticated political interaction with the existing system, which varies enormously from place to place. Uh, ideally, you take these small poor people that are driving minibuses and you politically organize them, and you turn them into viable modern companies with decent labor contracts. But that political transformation is extremely problematic and complicated because the industry itself is very, uh, it's like the mafia, you know, some of the people are driving their minibuses, but some of them are actually protection rackets that don't do anything. And you can't, you can buy off most of them and bring them in, but you don't really want to bring in the guys who were, you know, shooting people. So when, uh, when we, we worked with the city government of Johannesburg to transform the affected minibus taxi industry into the new BRT operators, uh, it, it, it caused a lot of trouble because they, the protection rackets were not uh, involved in the uh, new scheme. Uh, so we, we had to, you know, the army had to be rolled in. But uh, now it's fine and they've all uh, <laughs> subsequently, uh, the guys that were in the protection rackets know now that to get in, they got to buy their own minibus. So they bought minibuses in the next corridor, so they'll, they'll give in. But, um, but this guy was one of these minibus guys, and now he's the, the personnel manager for the new bus operating company on Rehabaya Quarter One. So this transition is really different than what happened in Cleveland when they put in the BRT Silver Standard in Cleveland, where the public bus operator uh, bought a new bus. You know. So that's different, you know, and the, the political. But what, what that political transformation did in Johannesburg was it brought about black empowerment. It brought about uh, suddenly uh, the, 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 the small minibus owners are in control of the new mass transit system rather than Siemens, rather than Mitsubishi. Uh, and they're earning a, a, an employment. You know, they're gonna, they've got a good job. Uh, the jobs aren't all exported to uh, factories and, you know, where the spare parts are all manufactured in, in 
in Japan or something. So <laughs> that transformation is extremely important. It's very different from place to place. Also very different is the level of criminality in your public streets. If you don't have a baseline of public security, your public space is probably going to look like this. You know, like they, they don't quite get the Charles Newman defensible spaces everybody looking just yet, but maybe they will. Uh, but right now, uh, along uh, the second corridor in Johannesburg, you, you've got fences and gates, and not like nice little cafes. But, but it'll come, hopefully. Uh, so that's pretty much uh, what I wanted to say. And if there's questions. <laughs> All right, any questions? If you have questions. Let me just ask then a final question and then we will close since we are running late and people have agendas. And um, uh, So what's next? The picture that you are, I have two questions actually. The picture that you're describing is quite extraordinary, right? And again, there are like steps and trajectories, things built up onto each other. So in that context, what's next, right? What are the next mobilizations? When you made the comparison just now of Cleveland versus Jakarta. In Cleveland, he buys a bus, that's it. Huh? Sure, good for. In Jakarta, it is a whole social, political, etc., economic operation. And, and so, what is next in that trajectory? And then secondly, are there obstacles, are there failed attempts, are there cities where it was tried and it simply didn't work, and if so, why? Or does it actually work? When you put your mind to it, whatever the local actors, do they actually succeed? Can I, can I add to question? Yeah, yes, yes. yes. Well, the last one's the easiest to answer. Uh, it's, it's mostly diesel, yeah, mostly diesel. I mean, you could do it, you know, clean diesel has less emissions than most other things. Uh, so you can do it with electric trolley bus, though, and they're, they're trying hybrids, but there's not a huge benefit. Uh, the, the bus rapid transit is a technology, and, but it's got its peculiarities. It's a technology in that you can screw up the engineering. And in Delhi, for instance, they screwed up the engineering. I mean, we were involved in that project and we sent you know, memo after memo saying this project is going to be a disaster because we could tell that it was going to slow down the bus speeds and destroy the mixed traffic speeds. Like, it was clear. For any engineer, we brought in three teams of engineers. We said, this is going to fail. And it did. And as but a result... The, the locals didn't respond to the, didn't the, we, the Well, it's Indian. You know, the weird okay. thing is, the no. weird thing is that, uh, you know, the, the people responsible for the project, who are friends of mine, by the way, very nice people, but not good engineers, they... Um, <laughs> they uh, they politicized the issue. They turned it into a kind of class warfare. Oh. And they said, it's about the, the rights of the poor and blah, blah, blah. And, but the truth was, they screwed up the engineering, you know? Like if you, you know, and, and, and so it's, it, it actually does, you do have to get the technology correct. You have to get the engineering correct. That's why we developed the BRT standard. It's like, because, because BRT is, it does two things that's different. It's not, people don't know what it is. It's not like you get your smartphone and you buy it. People don't know what is good BRT, what is bad. They don't know what it's like. It's more similar to organic food. You buy it, but it looks just like broccoli. You know, you don't know if it's organic. So we, we created the, the BRT standard so the general public can say, well, wait a minute. You know, they, they messed this up. This isn't the real thing. And, but that's, it, it, the, the reason it's peculiar is it has to be done by citizens groups and media and sophisticated NGOs because there isn't a single corporate entity that's pushing this, you know? The metro lob, the, the people pushing metros and light rails are Alstom, Siemens, Mitsubishi with the governments of Japan, the governments of Germany, and the governments of France backing them. There's obviously some interest by Volvo and 
But the truth is you can pretty much use any bus. You don't need a Volvo bus. You don't need a Mercedes bus particularly. So there's no concentrated corporate lobby pushing this technology. Uh, that's really different. Uh, so, uh, so it really uh, it requires a kind of political intervention on the part of citizens to get it right. Uh, but I'm not quite answering your question somehow. Yeah, What's let's, next? Let's, let's, let's mm -hmm. now take the cases, not the, one, the ones that have had problems, but the ones that worked. Right? And you already hinted at <coughs> one thing builds on the next. So in your vision, in your experience, what is next? Are there cases right now where you actually see yet another step which maybe none Nobody had foreseen. I, I mean, all of the innovation technology and in, in bus-based is 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 in the uh, it's in the service planning. So you can build infrastructure networks. And let's say, like Tehran's built 170 kilometers of exclusive bus lanes, but they run like one line that goes up and down here, and another line that goes across here, and they all stop local stops. And all the sophistication now is on the mathematics of, of networking systems with express services that cross between routes. And those networking uh, computational issues are extremely complicated. So you're probably going to be able to squeeze a huge amount of additional speed and capacity uh, uh, into these systems by optimizing the services within those infrastructures. So you're going to be seeing infrastructures that can be compatible with ex long distance express bus, where you could take a suburban express and it'll just take you straight into downtown. And is there, is, are particular firms controlling those technologies as applied to that, because network technologies are uh, we, we, we would be so excited if firms would actually get into this business. You know, the problem is like there's, because it's all government, there's no like obvious person to profit. Like if you're the New York City Metropolitan Transit Authority, you could squeeze out like a huge additional prof, uh, reduction in your operating loss by optimizing your services within even your existing infrastructure. But the, there's no, like, it's not a company, so there's no real incentive to do it, you know? So, uh, you, you know, there are engineers, there's, there's uh, modeling softwares that will do it for you. There's just not the kind of corporatized or public pressure to do it, but there should be more po political but in pressure Shanghai, to do it. I remember they have tried to network, right? Not, or not, not quite the way you are describing. Uh, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. It's more intermodal. The, right? Well, I mean, you're getting all this intermodal yeah. stuff because you've got your phone and whatnot. That's, that's certainly going to come, absolutely. Did you answer this question? I think I did. Yeah, yeah, did I answer your right. question? I OK. So. Yeah? People, it's over. Oh, there's one more question. Looks like a no. <laughs> uh, there's, there's a, there, it's a good idea. I'd like to see that coming. I mean, like, there's, there's a lot of systems like Porto Alegre in Brazil, for instance. The corridors are used by longer distance sort of regional buses. And there's a lot of administrative and institutional reasons why they haven't incorporated them into the, the BRT infrastructure very effectively yet. Uh, but hopefully that will come. I mean, there are cases where the longer distance buses will use some of the same infrastructure, but integration of the systems hasn't happened. I think it would be interesting to see more of that. Here's one last question. Oh. <laughs>
Okay, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much to the speakers.